everyone, welcome back. In this video, I'm going to talk about painful periods or dysmenorrhea. You may recall from my video about how periods work and how the menstrual cycle works that I spoke about anovulatory cycles where an egg isn't released. And these happen for the first one to two years after periods start. And ovulatory cycles, which eventually happens when egg release happens. And this happens first kind of irregularly and then eventually on a regular basis giving regular periods. Now we know that anovulatory cycles, which is where the egg isn't released, tend to be painless, whereas ovulatory cycles tend to be painful. So this is why for the first maybe year to two years after periods start, after menarche, the periods tend to be not painful and then they begin to get painful and in some girls significantly more painful, which may interfere with schooling and sports and social life, etc. So there are basically five reasons for painful periods in adolescence, or five common reasons, and I'll detail them in this video. The first is the production of a chemical pro called prostaglandins in the lining of the womb. And what prostaglandins do and they're quite normal in periods, but some girls maybe have more than others. What prostaglandins do is that they increase the tone or the strength of contraction of the womb muscles during the period, and that can cause a temporary decrease in blood flow to the womb, and that is painful. So that is a cause of painful periods, um, it's a common cause and it's not really an abnormality because these chemicals belong there. If this is the case, what we do to treat these painful periods is that we give medication which decreases the formation of these prostaglandins. And these are like, most commonly we use in gynecology, methanamic acid, but other medications which will be familiar to you include naproxen, ibuprofen, indomethacin. It's important to know that if these are being used you can only use one. You can't, you can't use them together because they're from the same family of drugs. If this isn't, this isn't successful in decreasing the pain then one may choose to go on to hormones like the combined pill or the mini pill etc. The second cause is heavy periods and again I would encourage you to look at my video on heavy periods in teenagers and this explains why it happens and it explains the treatment options are available. But in summary heavy periods can be painful because if periods are heavy what happens is that inside the womb blood clots form and they need to be squeezed out of the womb and that can cause contraction like pain to get these blood clots out. Now in both instances, girls can have other symptoms besides pain like feeling sweaty, feeling lightheaded or dizzy, sometimes girls faint. So painful periods and these co this cause of painful periods can not only affect the girl in one way, meaning causing pain, but she can have other symptoms as well. So you can understand how this can be quite uh, troublesome. The third possible cause that we don't like to miss is infection. And pelvic infections can cause pelvic pain, but they can also cause painful periods. They can also cause a discharge or a temperature but those may not be noticed or, or may not happen if it's a kind of localized infection. So girls who are sexually active, who have painful periods and they can sometimes cause heavy periods or irregular bleeding, then I would encourage these girls to have swabs done to rule out infections, including sexually transmitted infections, because as I say, this is something that we never want to miss because they're easily treated with antibiotics but if they're not treated, and the longer they're not treated for, then they can have long-term complications like issues with fertility, ectopic pregnancies, chronic pelvic pain. These can all be 
long-term issues that arise from pelvic infections. So if these three are the cause, then we would imagine that the pain will be ameliorated or eliminated either by simple therapy, like, as I mentioned before, methanamic acid, naproxen, etc., or the mini pill or the pill, or in case of infection, then the relevant antibiotics. If despite, if infection has been ruled out, and if despite using first and or second line treatment, so non-hormonal and hormonal treatment, then still the girl is in pain, in significant pain with periods, then we need to delve into further investigations to rule out other causes. And these are the last two causes I'm going to talk about. The first is endometriosis. So endometriosis is a common condition in women that can cause painful periods, pelvic pain and other symptoms. It is somewhat less common in adolescents than adult women, but certainly it does occur and can occur at a, pr a pretty young age. And we do know that women who have been diagnosed with endometriosis later on in life have a long history of having painful periods, pelvic pain, um, but it can take up to five or more years to diagnose endometriosis. I'm pleased to say that this actually is, tr is changing uh, so that women, generally speaking, are diagnosed earlier. So endometriosis is the condition that is caused, generally speaking, there are different theories, but endometriosis is caused by when the lining of the womb during a period, so most of the lining of the womb will go down through the vagina, but a small amount in many women will go backwards through the tubes into the pelvis. Now these bits of lining of the womb stay in the pelvis, they implant in the skin of the pelvis, if you like, or on pelvic structures like the ovaries, like the bowel, etc. And in some women, the deposits will die away and disappear, but in a significant proportion, they continue to grow and proliferate under the influence of hormones that are produced by the ovaries so that basically when the girl is having a period and it's coming out, there's a little bit of bleeding in the pelvis and that can cause inflammation and pain and eventually scarring or what we call adhesions. The diagnosis of endometriosis, uh, what we use to assist us is first we use imaging. So any girl who has painful periods, significantly painful, and who, despite treatment with first-line treatment, as mentioned before, should have some imaging. And in the first instance, that's usually an ultrasound scan, a pelvic ultrasound scan. And that's usually a jelly scan done on the tummy rather than an internal scan, unless she's sexually active. A normal ultrasound scan does not rule out endometriosis, but sometimes it can show some evidence of endometriosis, for example, some uh, blood in one of the ovaries and that's called an endometrioma or an ovarian cyst caused by endometriosis. If the ultrasound scan is normal, then the other option of imaging would be an MR or magnetic resonance imaging scan. And this is a more sophisticated way of scanning and therefore more likely to pick up endometriosis. Again, even if the MRI scan is negative, that is normal and there's no evidence of endometriosis, it does not rule out that the girl has endometriosis. The next step would be a surgery in the form of a laparoscopy or keyhole surgery. Adenomyosis can be kind of considered a subset of endometriosis where the lining of the womb, tiny bits of the lining of the womb, instead of coming out into the pelvis, they end up distributing themselves between the muscle fibers of the uterus. Uh, in my experience, adenomyosis is quite rare in adolescents. Um, endometriosis is more common. Endometriosis requires laparoscopy. Adenomyosis is usually a diagnosis made on imaging, either by an ultrasound scan or an MRI scan. 
I will talk more about endometriosis in its own right. I'll give it its own video. So stay tuned for that. The last thing that we need to consider is whether the teenager has what we call a uterine anomaly, which just means a difference in the shape or the formation of the womb. And sometimes this can be associated with a difference in the formation of the vagina. In order to diagnose this, again, it requires imaging in the first instance. So sometimes a uh, uterine anomaly can be diagnosed in ultrasound scan, but sometimes it can be a bit challenging. So that again, we fall to an MRI scan, which is the best way of imaging the uterus in detail. The other option is a 3D ultrasound scan, which again, gives very good uh, imaging of the uterus, but this isn't always available. Um, and sometimes it may require an internal scan, which again, if the girl has never been sexually active, uh, we try to refrain from performing. So it depends on the particular uterine anomaly or the particular difference in, in shape or formation of the womb. But the ones that cause painful periods, it tends to be because the blood is entrapped in an enclosed space in the uterus and unable to come out and trapped blood within a uterus is one of the most painful conditions in medicine. Um, it is horrendously painful. And as there's no release of the blood, the pain just gets worse and worse and worse and worse over time until sometimes the girl can't go to school at all. The secondary effect is that sometimes because the blood can't come out through the vagina, it goes backwards through the tube and it can cause endometriosis, which itself, as we know, is a cause for pelvic pain, as I discussed earlier. It's important to note that if the girl has been diagnosed with a uterine anomaly, there is a significant chance that she may have a difference in her renal tract or her kidneys in terms of the presence or absence of a kidney or the position of a kidney. So whenever we diagnose a uterine anomaly, we always do imaging or an ultrasound scan of the renal tract to make sure the kidneys are present and accounted for. The kidneys usually fun function well, but it's important to know if there's uh, a difference in where it's located. It's important to know that uh, for her future, for example, if she needs an operation and she has a kidney in the pelvis, it's useful for the surgeon to know that beforehand um, rather than being surprised during the operation. Depending on which anomaly it is, a treatment is determined by that. So those are the common causes of painful periods. And again, I always say periods should not stop you from going to school, from participating in sport, from going out with your friends, or doing whatever it is you enjoy. I see so many girls who miss school every single month for a day or two days because their periods are so painful. There are many things we can do to help. We can always, always sort them out one way or the other. So please, if you or your daughter is missing school or has significantly painful periods. Even if she's not missing school, it may still affect her schoolwork and her ability to concentrate in class, in exams or at home. Um, please take her along to a healthcare professional. Let her be investigated as appropriate. First line, second line therapy. Is this, if this isn't working and the problem is still significant, then please do again go in, inquire about imaging so that if there is an underlying diagnosis, then it can be sorted because if we don't know what's wrong, we can't really do much to fix it. Thanks for tuning in. Please don't forget to like and subscribe to my channel and do join us on my Facebook page, Gynecology Girl Talk, where we discuss similar issues in a safe, secure, supportive and friendly environment. We'd love to see you there. Thank you for watching.